and we are live good morning crypto warriors and welcome back to the gym of crypto episode 596 today is thursday august 27 2020 i'm king here to bridge the gap between the community and crypto every day monday through friday and today's top stories major korean crypto exchange seized after 99 percent trading volume allegedly faked becoming an incredible investor in the u.s is no longer just about being rich jp morgan blockchain creator says the project was going nowhere jp morgan wanted rid of it house dems request trump administration briefing on crypto seized from terrorists a new report from mexico says banks are used to launder money more than crypto and last but not least interview former nba player uh chris humphreys explains why he's excited about chain leak uh, but first and foremost of course is go ahead and look at these prices of the day that's right bloody it's all red today people everything is down in the dishes uh looks like bitcoin's coming in at eleven thousand three hundred nine dollars and 48 cents down 1.41 percent ethereum's at 382 dollars and 56 cent down 1.69 percent ripple at 26 cent down 5.72 percent chain link down 5.06 percent at 14 dollars and 49 cent uh, let's see, Litecoin is down 4.64% at $55.72. And last but not least, we have EOS here down 5.87% at $2.95. So as I said, uh, it looks like almost everything out there is in the red, all the major coins at least that uh, I know you all like to pay attention to. So uh, as we respe uh, expected, we've been pumping now for a solid few weeks here and retracements are all normal, but of course, uh it looks like as i said i was kind of waiting to september 1st to see what happens with the price i'm getting uh information here from the state of california that it looks like the stimulus package that they basically put into fema from what i've been told uh where they're trying to cover at least 300 of the 600 dollars that people were getting from federal uh unemployment or whatever federal pandemic relief they were receiving uh that was stopped it looks like california's on board to now offer that 300 in the government providing that other 300 so a lot of people will still get their 600 dollars a week if they're under those uh pandemic relief programs now that's important because as i was saying i was kind of eyeing that september 1st date as you know the date where it would be the first time in two to three weeks straight that a lot of people did not receive checks or not as much as they had previously received and i thought the price of bitcoin might suffer because of that so we're still ahead a few days so i'm not uh including this i think this is just a normal uh a re retracement or retractment from uh the, the bull run we've been on but i want to point that out because again it's going to determine of how many states do it how many states are going to say we're going to try to uh cover up this federal uh gap of money that you were receiving uh, to continue to receive that same amount so again i think if it doesn't happen in mass across the states we will continue to see the price not only bitcoin but a lot of other commodities uh and markets drop because people are going to start to pull out the uh pull out money in order to live right uh but again a couple of states are already on board i know las vegas i believe jumped on already or uh nevada and california is jumping on it and i'm sure other states will follow as well but until then it hasn't been uh certified or guaranteed yet until then no one is receiving that additional income so again i'm kind of eyeing that uh september first day to see what happens then all right, quick, uh, quick shout outs. What's going on? Lucky Lloyd, Ariel Walker, Bitcoin Jake. Uh, yes, yeah, smash that like and share. That's right. Buy the dip. Leroy Forbes, Malik Howard, Wired Sparks. Hello, hello, hello. Uh, top story of the day. Something we've kind of talked about before, but it was one of those things where you always hear about it, you kind of see it, but there isn't a lot of like legitimate proof out there. It looks like we finally have it. Major Korean crypto exchange has been seized after 99% trading volume allegedly fake that is right this was a student in class that didn't just copy one or two answers no they wrote down your name on their own paper people that is right they wrote down your name on their paper i mean how dumb can you be you don't want to just go for uh for 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 the b you don't want to have the a minus no you want to have the a plus plus just like your neighbor right exact same answers verbatim word for word that's what i'm seeing here you have a crypto exchange in the year 2021 all eyes are on crypto whether people are talking about it or not all eyes at least from institutions and governments are on crypto right and you decide during this time and years leading up to it that you're going to fake not almost all of it but just about 
All of it. I mean, basically, this is like a uh, one of those medical tests you get where they say, yeah, where it's 99% effective. The medicine is 99% effective. They want to tell you 100, but they're like, there is this 1%, these ones, these and twos. These. It's the same thing. I feel like this crypto exchange was like, we basically tried to fake all the trading, but unfortunately, we did have real customers come onto our platform while we were faking the trading, and that accounts for that 1% we couldn't capture. It's crazy. But it looks like police claim that wash trading and market manipulation by the owner and management team of the Coinbit Exchange netted over 100 billion won. Again, that's the Coinbit Exchange. I've actually heard of them. Uh, fairly popular. Again, I uh, haven't used them myself, but that is crazy. It looks like South Korea's third largest cryptocurrency exchange, Coinbit, has been seized by police following fraud allegations. According to an August 26 report by the Seoul Shinman, 99% of transaction volume on the exchange was faked through wash trading. Now, you know here on this show, we usually try uh, to go with the industry, to go with the businesses and the people in the industry. And we're always looking like, hey, are the police or are the government regulators overstepping boundaries here? Just looking at the story, I'm going to say no, because uh, if they were overstepping boundaries, they would probably come to the table with something more realistic. Uh, at least 74% of their trading is washed. We know this for a fact. We can prove 74. They came with like, no, we can tell you for a fact 99% of this is Fugazi. So this is crazy to see, but it looks like the Seoul Metropolitan Police searched and confiscated a number of properties, including Coinbits headquarters in the Gangnam, Gangnam style, uh, district of Seoul. Uh, that's crazy. I mean, they went after the HQ. We're not going after these satellite offices. We're going up into the main thing. Uh, it looks like Coinbiz owner, Chairman Cho Mo, Choi Mo, and his management team are accused of inflating transaction values and manipulating token prices using a number of ghost accounts. Again, this fraudulent activity is netting them over 100 billion won, which equals uh, equates to about $84.26 million in total. This is crazy. Uh, they say he was suspected to uh, start wash trading on the exchange uh, by an insider in May, or excuse me, uh, authorities were alerted to this in May, uh, following an investigation and found that between August of 2019 and May of 2020, and again, it's unfortunate that this happened, and I'll kind of go into, I think I know why it happened in a moment, uh, but it looks like between August 2019 and May of 2020, 99% of transactions on exchange one, where major cryptocurrencies are Bitcoin, were traded had no corresponding deposit and withdrawal uh, details. In addition, it found that Exchange 2, which mainly listed smaller cryptocurrencies, blocked coin transactions with other exchanges, enabling Choi and his team to con uh, control the supply of coins. This allowed the management team to directly realize market margin by buying and selling large quantities of coins at certain times. Oh my goodness, people, you don't understand how big of an issue this actually is to the market. And this is the good part of Bitcoin, being uh, so new, uh, cryptocurrency being so new, not a lot of people knowing about it because if a lot of people knew about this, if a lot of people were actually trading, this would send people for the hills, uh, people running for the hills. Now, a couple of things I want to unpack there. Um, and we talked about this more or less, Bitcoin Zay has really talked about this um, as he really gets into the weeds of fake volume and wash trading. I don't get into the weeds of all that. Uh, I kind of just suspect from a business perspective almost every major exchange is doing it at some level maybe not 99 percent but at some level i think they're doing it now uh what i want to uh, point out with this as you see the dates august 2019 to may 2020 uh, until recently this year we have been in the prolonged bear run or uh bear bear market right uh we saw beginning 2018 all the way until you know a few months ago of this year we were in a terrible bear market so uh, companies are going out of business left and right. We talked about many companies uh, cutting employees or just, just literally just going out of business, not exit scamming, just saying, hey, we can't afford to keep up. We thought we made a lot of money when Bitcoin reaches all time high. We hired a bunch of people. We got a bunch of computers in here. We got this technology. We got air conditioning this big ass office and we can't pay for it, people, right? They're going crazy. I understand that bear market affected a lot of companies in this industry. A lot of people who switched over from their last profession to start new companies were affected, right? So if you're in exchange uh, and you have millions of dollars of overhead, 
or you're doing millions of dollars of trades and all this other stuff is going on, then all of a sudden it stops overnight or, uh, or drastically reduces overnight, you're probably gonna go out of business. And it looks like that was what's most likely was gonna happen to Coinbit. They were either gonna go out of business or just become unimportant, which in the cryptocurrency space, as fast as it moves, it is basically like going out of business. I mean, <laughs> cryptocurrency companies are, it's like you have a better chance to be like an NBA player or a rapper, right? It's, it's like literally, uh, some of their lifespans are a year and a half, two years. They come and they go so quickly. So um, it looks like this was a way to circumvent that. That's what I'm guessing. I'm assuming that this company saw that, hey, well, there weren't people trading. We're about to go out of business. We're about to be forgotten. We need to keep this thing going. We need to keep the facade going at least, at least until the bull market comes back. And then we can kind of, you know, uh, ease our way out of it. The issue here with that, uh, whether that's the truth or not, again, this is just me um just trying to make an assumptions and piece this together why they would do it uh but rather regardless if that's the reason or not uh the bottom line is once an exchange starts doing this the chance of them stopping is highly unlikely right once you learn to watch trade once you understand how you can fake volume and your customers aren't catching on and you can make your exchange seem like one of the best the biggest and brightest out there why would you stop if it works for your business right now i don't want to put everything on coinbit uh, you all are out of your mind if you don't think some of these other exchanges that are around right now, the big ones, uh, haven't done the same thing in the past. I believe that they have. Uh, in fact, I know more than belief than they have. I've been on some of these exchanges uh, and I've seen some of the value. I mean, you remember when Poloniex was around, right? Poloniex had great volume on it in 2016, 2017 before people forgot about it, basically. But you could kind of tell when the volume started to uh, become fake. When they started when, by the troll box, I mean, sometimes they would have the volume numbers up there, or what's being traded, and you look at the troll box of how many people are chatting, and you're like, the numbers not adding up because usually when it is pumping, there, I mean, the chat box would just be full of people, just nonstop people trolling, talking, uh, all type of crypto stuff, right? Uh, and then I remember at times that again, that number, that volume number, when they were reporting some of the numbers and the cash that they had, it was just like, well, why are the amount of people in the troll box this month like greatly reduced than it were last month? So. There were already things like that where we used to call out, and that's some Bitcoins they would tell me back day, like, yeah, these companies are more likely watch trading or whatever. Uh, but again, the biggest issue with this, the biggest issue uh, with watch trading and faking volume is that they're working their exchange the same way banks are working your money, where they don't have all your money there, right? They have only a small percentage of it there. That's what these crypto exchanges are doing. Not all of them, but there are some crypto exchanges realizing, hey, we don't if you trade your ripple for uh stellar right or your bitcoin for ethereum these exchanges realize since everything is in-house they have your private keys you do not own the crypto they could just credit your account and said that trade was actually made right and they can use that crypto and make another trade or they can take that money out of crypto and reinvest it into something else barring that they have their numbers together as far as uh, how much they need to be, you know, solving everything, how much they need to have to make sure your money can get your money back on hand. But by and large, uh, exchangers can do this. You don't control your crypto. You could claim, you know, you could say you make these trades, they can credit your accounts and the entire time they're gonna be saying, no, we're actually using all of this money to invest uh, in, in Chainlink or something, right? Who knows? Uh, so that's the biggest issue. Um, I'm glad that this was found out. Honestly, uh, I'm glad, that, you know, I'm, I'm not really for regulation and police in this space. I'm happy, I'm, I, you know, they're pointing this out. But this is also one of the things where the police don't even need to do anything now. This is a headline. I can guarantee you they're going to arrest themselves. You know what I mean? Like, they're going to go out of business. No one's going to want to go there because no one wants to put money on an exchange where they know it's not liquid enough to get their money right back. Uh, but again, that's Coinbit over in South Korea. Crazy to see people crazy. What's going on, Tessa Hall, Sergeant Crypto, Tony Nolly, Tony Morissette, Antonio, what's going on, S1 Dubs, hello, hello, hello. Oh, here was another good news story, people. How many years, how many stories have we harped and harped on this? It looks like becoming an accredited investor in the United States is no longer just about being rich. I mean, wow. It only took a pandemic, a bad market, and Bitcoin on the horizon to take over the financial system for you all to say, I guess everybody's allowed to invest now, right? It looks like the SEC, uh, it says has, they haven't actually yet. The SEC is planning to relax rules that once prioritized net worth over financial sophistication. Now, these rules have not yet been relaxed. That is their plan. And again, like most uh, big governments, companies, and people who just like to talk, 
The SEC is one of them. I am not holding my breath until I see this actually out and riding, signed, sealed, and delivered, but this is their plan. Looks like the Securities and Exchange Commission, or SEC, is now amending its definition of an accredited investor to relax the purely wealth-based requirements after announcing such plans in December 2019. Now, uh, accredited investors in the United States enjoy special privileges with the SEC, namely being able to participate in certain types of simplified security sales like Regulation D. Let me put this in layman terms and what's really going on. Accredited investors in the United States pay the SEC, which is basically like extortion, uh, to be accepted into a special club with special privileges. The privileges, uh, it's not that the privileges allow you to, uh, to participate in certain types of simplified security sales. No, no. The privileges allow you to do whatever the SEC says you can do that day. Uh, what they really do is give you uh, legal and military and police protection. They're saying that, hey, we've deemed you quality enough to be a part of our, our club. Uh, you have enough money to it. Because, again, we don't want everybody. We don't need everybody money. We're trying to make this exclusive. The SEC is a business just like every other business out there. They're trying to make their club exclusive. They're trying to have a payment plan structure. They only want certain members. They got it. And they did all this by weeding people out financially. And then once they had their people, they're like, hey, you want to be a part of this cool little thing over here? You want to make more money over here? That for whatever reason, we're telling normal people they can't do. Uh, normal people can't do an ICO. You guys aren't smart enough, nor do you have enough money uh, to just, just say, I want to invest in the project I like. But accredited investors who are with our club, they can invest in that project. So no. Uh, the special privilege is just the same special privilege anyone would get if they paid a gang to watch them. Uh, they paid a gang to protect them. They paid the mafia, whoever they were to pay. Those are the same special privileges the credit investors are getting. I want to make sure that's clear. You're not, uh, you know, <laughs> some, some type of astute uh, financial wizard or nothing. No, you just have a lot of money who puts you in a club who has a club of people with guns to protect you all to do what you like. So. Um, that's one thing. And I'm not saying this is bad on credit investors. I'm, I'm smacking down the SEC. I'm all for credit investors. Uh, the SEC noted that previous definitions relied on specific income and net work criteria, uh, which did not take their actual financial sophistication into account. In the case of the United States, these requires, uh, requirements amounted to either $1 million in net worth or a stable income of at least $200,000 per year. Again, this was my beef. Uh, at the end of 2017, when I knew regulators were going to rush their little money-hungry hands uh, into the market in 2018, the corrupt little greasy money-hungry hands, when I knew they were coming, I kept saying this made no sense. You wanted to arrest, and you have arrested, and find people who participated or uh, hosted ICOs because they weren't accredited investors, even though we were getting investors literally from all parts of the world because that's the thing about an ICO. It's not just the United States borders. You can have someone in India with three dollars to the name say, you know what, I want to put a dollar fifty into this project because I believe in it. There's no reason for SEC intervention into that. There's no reason for an accredited investor in that. The guy in India who has three dollars to his name cannot be an accredited investor, but he may have a phone or internet connection and say, I want to send this dollar fifty over there for this project. That is the point of an ICO. Uh, now in 2018, when they started coming after all these ICOs and using the Howey test from the 1800s to determine what was the security uh, and saying you weren't accredited investors again. Uh, and I take this personal because this is a part of our business. We shut it down because it was like, you know, the, the SEC said we could only do certain things with accredited investors. and We couldn't do it for you poor uh, retail investors out there. And we said, well, no, our thing is to bridge the community and crypto. We want to work with everyone. Right. Uh, but, but the beef here was this, I, I think I used like Paris Hilton or somebody, for example. I was like, well, Paris Hilton was like literally born wealthy. It's like no knock against her good. I mean, that's what most parents want to do, right? They want to leave their children with wealth or a better start than they had, right? But if you're left with a silver spoon, per se, if you're left with a million dollars in your name, then you're automatically an accredited investor. Technically, you can be a credit investor by the time you're three years old, your parents get a million dollars in your account. But you're telling me that same... Uh, three-year-old, 17-year-old, 18-year-old, 24-year-old who parents left them money and who are who is now an accredited investor is more sophisticated financially than someone who worked from rags to riches to go from zero to $850,000. Oh man, I'm $150,000 short of my net worth. Or maybe I only make $175,000 a year, but I started off uh, as the fry cook. Now I own the business, right? Who knows, but you're telling me if I fall short of this $2,000 per year uh, stable income or a million dollar net worth, 
that I don't qualify to invest in something I've done my own due diligence on, but someone who just because their parents gave them money, they could be seen as a credit investor, could actually invest in that. That is how the rich get richer, as they say, and the poor get poorer. These, these, there are these unfair systemic, uh, systemic barriers, uh, financial barriers, as you can see, for whatever reason, that are in place. And the SEC has been promoting these barriers uh, and keeping these barriers up for I don't know how long now. And them uh, reeling this back, them saying uh, you can now be an accredited investor, you don't need to be rich. This all goes about the narrative I keep trying to break down. Even I keep telling you Bank of America, JP Morgan, uh, Wells Fargo, and all these people are going to try to uh, hold the crypto narrative. The SEC is doing it too, except it's not just for crypto, it's for the entire financial market because the US government, just like many governments around the world, are now like, oh shit, like we let this thing happen and it's here up upon us. The US doesn't want, like, they're not going to just start changing their rules. Like, for one, we're stubborn. We are a stubborn country. I mean, if you talk about a country that's stubborn, the US is probably at the top of the list. We want things our way and we want them now. And if we don't get them, we're ready to offer you diplomacy and freedom until we have them, right? So we don't change things. You never need to change things when you're the person in charge, when you're telling everybody what to do. You think the school bully is going to come to school on Friday afternoon and all of a sudden everybody hold out your hand. Let me give you all your $2 back I've been stealing all year. No, it doesn't happen like that. Now, maybe if the school bully uh, goes to school and realizes he took everybody, he's taken so much of everybody's money that no one has anything left to give, then maybe he'll come in and be like, all right. I know I used to smack y'all around for two dollars, but everybody today just give me fifty cent and I'll call it even, right? That's all the SEC is doing. They're being the same old bullies as they always have been, except now they're saying, "Hey, we're not going to just take from the wealthy, from the one percent. We're actually now going to start taking from everyone, and we're going to open up this door for it." And they would not do it unless they didn't have the volume that they previously had in previous years to keep up the benchmark number they've always had. So that number of whatever they have in their mind, whether they're uh, making, I'm just as an example, $200 billion from fees and registrations and licenses from accredited investors, that number has probably slipped. And now they're saying, oh, you know, hey, oh crap, we need to make sure we still make our 200 billion. We gotta get our nut. And because of that, you don't need to be an actual accredited investor as we define it anymore. We're gonna relax these rules. If that's the case, just relax them all the way. Um, <laughs> you can't tell another human, like, who in the SEC has authority to tell another human who can invest in what project with their own money or not? Again, this is absurd to me, people, but that's just me. I don't know. Uh, let me look at the comments. I want to know what you all think. Uh, uh, S1Dub said, we dub ourselves accredited investors, hence crypto. Exactly. Daniel Willis says, such BS. They say they want to protect people, but they have no problem selling lottery tickets to poor people. Exactly. I mean, it's crazy. Uh, Sergeant Crypto, I thought the SEC were just regulators meaning they don't make laws they only enforce them they just blew their whole issue up we knew they were lying all along bunch of idiots well what's even crazier um and i could be wrong in this i haven't looked it up in a while i thought the sec and it may be someone else but i thought it was the sec not only are they just regulators but they're actually just supposed to be uh pushing out guidance they're supposed to be pushing out guidance so the fact that they're uh, pushing out this guidance, <laughs> again, guidance sounds a lot like freedom and diplomacy when you're off the coast uh, of a country you don't like, but when they're pushing this guidance, however, as you said, they're actually regulating it and they're basically enforcing it as well, or not them personally enforcing it, they're calling up you know, someone with a gun who can't enforce it. So yeah, it's crazy to see this, but I mean, the SEC, as I say, people, criminals go to criminal. Uh, let's see. Tesla said, to me, they don't want the little man to get wealthy. Oh, of course not. They definitely don't want that. Uh, yeah, Tesla also said, who is the SEC to tell grown adults how to spend their hard work and money on investments? I mean, really think about that, people. Um, you know what? Maybe I'm, I'm, I'm 74 years old. I've never been wealthy in my life, right? I just had my measly uh, thirty dollars to $40,000 pay, pay uh, salary for the last 20 or 30 years. And I'm finally ready to retire at 74 years old. I don't have a ton of money. I don't have a net worth of a million dollars. And I'm definitely uh, not making 200 a year and neither have I ever, right? I'm just making my measly 30 to 50 to the government. You're also telling that 74 year old because you don't have $200,000 $200, in salary or a million dollars in net worth, you're not sophisticated enough to invest in any of these markets. And if you do so, not only are we gonna find you, but we're also gonna send you to jail and to prison right next to murders and rapists, all because you try to use your own money to improve your station in your life. I mean, you cannot 
make this up people this is american law at the fullest right here uh and yeah this is the things that make people go crazy um but in other news here's a better news story jp morgan blockchain creator says the project was going nowhere jp morgan wanted rid of it that is right uh he also said that nothing built on ethereum is capable of scaling that's right bang bang shots have been fired people go after him uh, crazy story. Looks like Will Martino, the former lead engineer for JP Morgan's first blockchain, Juno, shared insights into the project acquisition by Consensys with Cointelegraph. He believes that while the technology was good for his time and inherited fundamental flaws from Ethereum, since leaving JP Morgan, he has gone on to found Kadena, a proof of work blockchain that employs sharding to achieve scalability. Now, people, what's crazy about this story is that if you watch this in the past, this story tells you everything we basically said that J.P. Morgan was trying to do, why it wouldn't work, and what is going on around that part of the world, right? Uh, you know, and you can read the story also on Cointelegraph. Uh, but again, this guy, Will Martino, the former lead engineer for J.P. Morgan's first blockchain, he started talking about all the issues of why the blockchain wouldn't work and why J.P. Morgan doesn't want it. Now, uh, the biggest thing is something we already said there is the same problem the government's having they keep trying to control it they keep trying to figure out how to control it and as we always use the example of the internet and the intranet no one wants to use your company's intranet when you have the internet and you can use the entire world's one right it doesn't make sense and that's what jp morgan was trying to do with juno and what they're trying to do with quorum they're trying to create their own blockchain and eventually have their own cbdc on that blockchain where they can control everything top to bottom of course it's not going to work no one wants it the other issue they ran into is a technological one hey this thing isn't ready to scale nor is it ready for private businesses to try to turn it into the internet the technology isn't there because people haven't tried to do it yet no one was trying to do it when bitcoin's blockchain came out open source technology everyone's working on that public open source everyone's working on decentralized networks public open source technology for those who don't know what that means that means we share everything there isn't any secrets there isn't any hiding and this is only for you and not for them it's for everyone and everyone can look at the same code and everyone can build upon it and everyone can fork it or go in different directions and create things how they see fit but the bottom line is this is all public and it's made for everyone no one started creating these applications with the ideal in mind of just one we just want our own private business and we have this. We just want our own company. No one started creating this stuff. So now that these companies are trying to create it, you have to remember, first of all, they're already getting second rate talent. Almost every company out there, uh, with the exception of the last two or three years, now as of recent, when we talked about the job hirings, they have been hiring better developers. But up until recently, it's been second rate talent because all the first rate talent was working on Bitcoin, people, or maybe over there on Ethereum or some of the other big projects. They weren't going to smaller projects. That don't make sense. In this space as a developer, you're the rock star if you work on Bitcoin. You're the rock star if you're working on some of the Ethereum applications. And at this point, the DeFi uh, space. Those were the rock stars. Right. You're not a rock star saying, oh, I'm going over to uh, Goldman Sachs to start this. Or I'm going over to Wells Fargo. Th those aren't the rock stars. Because already you're crippling. For one, from a developer's point of view, you're already crippling yourself. They're going to tell you what they want you to make. How they want you to make it they're going to give you uh they're basically going to give you this, this rigid system of things you can and can't do you remember this is for a private company this isn't for you to give our, all our information out to to other people so it's going to be very rigid and they're not going to pay you as much as you're worth um they're starting to but initially they weren't because they didn't understand how much you're worth they didn't understand a developer that can work on bitcoin blockchain or other other uh cryptocurrencies out there have a going rate of 250 200k right now right because if you can make that next big project, you could possibly get a project made up and running and out to the market and have funding of up to 60 million plus dollars within three to four months. People are like that is possible to do in this space. So when you're talking about uh, the possibility of by yourself uh, getting something going at a very low cost with a very low barrier to entry and you yourself can make millions in returns, it just doesn't make sense to go work for somebody and have like a boss at JP Morgan, right? It just does not make sense. So um, I say all that because I think those are a lot of the issues they face. He kind of puts that in perspective. Those were some of the issues that are faced. Uh, and he also talks about consensus, which we said. I thought it was a marketing play from the beginning. I thought they were buying into consensus just to have them on their team. He basically said that too. Uh, details regarding consensus, uh, consensus recent acquisition of Quorum are sparse. It was noted while divesting 
quorum JP Morgan was making an investment in consensus. Uh, Martino believes that the investment that the bank made was higher than the price tag of quorum, which I also said. Uh, he suggests that this might have been an easy way for JP Morgan to get rid of a business unit that was not going anywhere. He said quorum was a real attempt at making Ethereum technology stick in an industrial setting, but it's being rehomed, and I really don't think it's going to be a lot of progress down the line for consensus. From my point of view, I think they're mostly buying the brand and being able to just use the quorum trademark and intellectual assets from that point of view for marketing. So they're using each other. Uh, and he said his real issue with Quorum is that it does not scale. Now my only thing about Quorum not scaling, like all, ne all new technology, it hasn't had the, uh, you know, it's brand new. Every new technology will always run into the scaling issue, I think, at some point. Uh, because if not, like, you know, do you really, uh, most creators, uh, everyone wants their thing to be great, but it's kind of far-fetched you have to reel it in from a business sense for you to say, well, I'm gonna create this awesome product and it's gonna go out to a million people and I'm gonna have it ready to go out to a million people. No, when you, most people start products, they're hoping one or two people like it. Then they're hoping 10 or 20 people like it. Then they're hoping thousands of people like it and then millions. And each time you hit one of those benchmarks, you have to scale. So that's kind of natural to me. Uh, and also Martino said the deeper issue is also stemming from the Ethereum virtual machine, EVM. So when you take something like the Ethereum virtual machine, which was, which was never the bottleneck on a public blockchain, and you put it into a private chain, all of a sudden it can uh, very easily become the bottleneck. And that is one of the reasons that Quorum had a lot of trouble just performing more than the numbers I have heard between 200 and 100,000 transactions per uh, second. Again, um, he also, I'll just kind of end it. He also goes on to say, JP Morgan, one of the biggest companies ever, can't drive adoption even when they have a great internal use case, you have to ask yourself why. And my answer to that is that the technology is just fundamentally limited. And if you go and talk to other large system integrators, large consultancies, you'll hear very similar things. So as long as you don't have someone who holds a lot of Ethereum tokens as a head of blockchain for the company, you're going to, <laughs> I gotta say that one more time. So as long as you don't have someone who holds a lot of Ethereum tokens as a head of blockchain for the company, you're going to find that people say, we have tried using Ethereum, it just doesn't work. Now again, uh, to quickly unpack this. Yes, and I'll just start with this, yes. Um, JP Morgan, one of the biggest companies who have a great internal use, can't drive adoption, not because the technology is fundamentally limited, it's because as I just said, it was never intended for this use case. It, was, it wasn't meant for this. It wasn't meant to be kept as a big secret, right? <laughs> Uh, so I think that's some of the issues that they may be having that they're not looking at. Um, and also, again, from a technological point of view, it's brand new. You're right, JP Morgan, one of the biggest companies ever is trying to implement this technology. Of course, they're gonna have issues because they're not trying to implement it over to a mom and pop. I think that would be easier. I think it would be easier to go to some uh, mom and pop or uh, was it, uh, it was a credit it was a credit union type of bank, a smaller bank, and start it with them, not some huge bank that's over you know everywhere on the planet start small so i don't know um also they talk about the bottom the bottleneck the uh ethereum virtual machine i again i can see that being a bottleneck because as you put it wasn't meant for that it, it, it wasn't created for that and is, and then this is also brand new technology so i don't think this is the end of it i think the technology does have to grow and scale like all technology um but i am happy to see jp morgan throw up their hands on it and say you know what we're gonna leave this alone right now it's not working for us or whatever the reason is um, i do like seeing that so of course um this is another hit at ethereum they've always been taking hits for the longest now of course this year they've really been uh people really been coming down on them so we'll see how they respond but again that's jp morgan and it looks like they are jumping ship as soon as they started uh let's see who else we got jp <laughs> ryan cooper said jp morgan with the tons of cocaine you already know uh let's see Sergeant Crypto, what's going on? Wire Sparks at JP Morgan, Bank of America, City. Don't want to bend thy knee. Look, I know they will bend thy knee to the crypto space. Uh, let's see. Ryan Cooper said, working on my certified blockchain expert certificate right now. There we go. Let's go ahead and get it. Uh, Ryan Cooper, there you go. And that's my point, Ryan Cooper. I wasn't even going to go into the, the tech side of it into deep detail, but side chain, scalability, sharding so many things that they didn't even look at and again it's because i think they're realizing uh, private companies are trying to copy with with, with with crypto companies like bitcoin and ethereum are doing and they don't realize how many people are working on it i'll end it there 
these private companies are trying to hire a few developers here and there, trying to have the next big thing that overtakes Bitcoin. Uh, <laughs> and they just don't, I mean, they think they have the resources, but they don't have the resources. So it's interesting to see, and as always, we'll see what happens next. Um, House Democrats request Trump administration briefing on crypto seized from terrorists. Now, uh, this is real short. I just wanted you all to see this headline. As it says, basically, uh, some House Democrats are going to Trump. It looks like, uh, let's see, what is it called? I was looking, yep. The U.S. Department of Justice has seized crypto from several terror organizations, including Al-Qaeda, ISIS, Hamas, and Al-Qassam. And it looks like initiated by Manuel Cleaver, chairman of the House Financial Services Subcommittee on National Security, uh, International Development and Monetary Policy, uh, and subcommittee member Josh Gottenheimer requested information about the operation from Treasury Secretary Steve Mushkin. Uh, they basically want to know, hey, how are terrorist groups getting their hands on crypto? What are they doing with it? How can we keep track of it, right? Now, the reason why this first headline is important as the House of Democrats uh, use our taxpayer money to start another what sounds to be a very or what sounds to be a very soon to be a special task force or something right that will use more taxpayer money uh, before they start using all our money I want to highlight the story that came right after it a new report from Mexico says banks are used to launder more money than crypto that's right do not use our taxpayer money on Al Qaeda ISIS Hamas and whoever else as when it comes to laundering crypto or using crypto for illicit uh, activities, when there is still information coming out on a daily basis that banks are the ones that launder the most money. Uh, they have been for the longest. I think they will continue to be. Right now, crypto, not a lot of people still knows about it. Not a lot of mass adoption. And I mean, can you imagine going to the drug deal talking about, hey, you heard of Bitcoin? Like it doesn't work like that, people. They're not on the phone. Under my assumption, from what I know about criminals, they're not on the phone, or the smart criminals are not on the phone talking about the plans they're about to carry out, right? So if they got to do a lot of things in person, I can only imagine this terrorist meeting where uh, you know my man is expecting three uh, three million dollars in straight blue face notes. You know, man, all hundreds, and you come up there with a phone. Uh, you know, we got the cocaine over here. We got the rockets and grenades over here. And then and, and, uh, AKs over here. You're like, look, I know I told you I was going to give you cash, but have you heard of Bitcoin? All right, look, look, don't trip. I'm going to send you this $3 million. I'm going to come to you in like eight minutes. They're sending the cave and just waiting eight more, uh, uh, six minutes. Oh, that transaction should be coming. I don't think it's working like that, people. All right. I just don't see it happening in mass right now. I mean, these bad guys are probably having the same complaints you all have about crypto. I can't buy my cup of coffee with it, right? They're probably saying the same thing. I can't buy an eighth with it. I don't know. So my point is that I don't want to hear or see any more stories from the United States government using our taxpayer money to go after, first it was criminals, now we can elevate the terrorists, I love it, uh, to go after terrorists for using crypto for less illicit goods. We got enough shit going on in this country. We don't need to worry about nobody else right now and what they doing. We need to figure out what we're doing. Uh, but again, I want to make sure we talk about this report real quick. Mexico's Financial Intelligence Unit recently published the results of its second national risk assessment. The report highlighted that the risk of money laundering in the banking sector far surpasses the issues encountered by fintech companies. According to El Econ Econ uh, Economist, I used to be able to say this stuff, people. I'm terrible right now. El, I'm going to do it. I'm going to sound this out. El Econ, Econ, it's the Mista. It's the Mista part that's getting to me. It's the Spanish word for the economy with Mista at the end. The so called G7 banking group, BBBA Santander. I know when you are going to uh, pronounce that for me in the, uh, in the troll box too, so please do it for me. <laughs> City, City Benamex. All right, so seven different banks, people, including HSBC, Scotia Bank, <laughs> and BBBA. I can say those words. Uh, registers significantly more money laundering in Mexico than blockchain firms. Brokerage companies, exchange firms, and banking institutional providers are also included in the high-risk classification given to the report. So yes, so brokerage companies, exchange firms, and banking providers have all been set in this report to launder not a little bit more, a lot more money than crypto. Something we've already known. I mean, HSBC, don't they have them on some Netflix special laundering money? Uh, we've known this already. And of course, we just call it JP Morgan with the billion dollars in cocaine that somebody alluded to earlier. So again, my only beef with this and the reason why I bring it up to you for those who are in touch 
with your uh, congressmen and women and whoever else, your senators, you need to be pressing them. Stop using our tax money on this fake fairy crypto chase of who's doing it when in reality it's happening with the dollar, right? Let's focus on that. Uh, let's see. Oh, Antonio said the blue face analogy has my girl cracking up. Hey, you know how they do it out here. <laughs> All right, and last story, I want to end on a great news story. Uh, let's go ahead and give this man a hand clap. He's been through a lot. But uh, interview, this is on Crypto Slate. Former, you know what? We actually need to get him on here too because I'm, I'm sure we can get him on here. Uh, but former NBA player Chris Humphreys explains why he's excited about what? Chainlink, people. That is right. Shout out to Tiffany from New York. She sent me this article uh, a few days ago. But um, basically, this article is about Chris Humphreys. He's been involved in Chainlink, it looks like, from the beginning or from the early stages before they started blowing up as a recent. Uh, so kudos to him, for one, because when you have a, uh, uh, a, a company like this, when you're, when you're first when you're a, per, a person like this, you know, you play in the NBA, your personality, your investor, you know, all this good stuff now, uh, you have this public persona, and you're publicly telling a lot of people about a pick, right? I mean, everybody likes to make money. You're telling them about a pick, essentially, and that pick essentially turns out to be a unicorn which chain link has when you're looking at the traditional sector it has turned out to be a unicorn already you better believe the reason why something that price is dropping the way it is because people start to sell uh but i mean that puts you in a very good position that puts you in that position as like the guru of crypto kind of uh at least for other investors who are now looking at you for guidance so shout out to chris humphreys from that uh looks like the ethereum based asset price Performance alone has been impressive per data from Crypto Slate. Link has gained 74.34% in the past month alone and approximately 600% from the March uh, capitulation low. So again, if you pick something on Wall Street, if you're an NBA player, if you're a personality, you've been on, you know, we've been on the TV show uh, with the Kardashians, all that. when you're that popular and you're telling people about a 600% gain before it happens, oh, you're set for the rest of your life. People are going to listen to that financial advice for a very long time. Uh, but it looks like uh, you can see this tweet here on July 9th of 2020, which is uh, still early. But it, Chris Humphreys is tweeting, since my first tweet about Chainlink on April 7th, 45 plus additional partnerships have been announced. Reference data increased from 29 to 31 and price increased 145%. This is a long term play. Still, these short term wins are impressive. So. Uh, this is pretty cool to see. Again, this entire article is on Crypto Slate. I'll put that in the notes for you all if you want to check it out. But I did want to give Chris Humphreys a shout out and a hand clap. <laughs> Looks like he's an officially a crypto warrior and he's getting off to a good start. So uh, shout out to him and his team for that one. Other than that, people, that is the news for today. I know we went over. It was a lot of great news. A lot of crazy stuff going on. I had to be on my, uh, on my soapbox today because I'm tired of this tax money going in the wrong direction. Uh, but as always, this is uh, the Gem and the Crypto. Thanks for watching. Make sure you smash that like and share. And I will see you all tomorrow uh, with some... Uh, I'm looking at these comments, so I'm still laughing right now. Uh, I'll see you all tomorrow with some more crypto news. Cheers.